Okay, good morning, everyone. I just clicked record, so we're going to get started. Um, welcome to the Rails Online Table Libraries and the 2020 Elections. Uh, my name is Dan Bostrom. I'm the Rails Member Engagement Manager. In a few minutes, I'm going to be turning this presentation over to uh, Haley Samuelson and Nate Gass. Uh, but first, I just want to go over some news and updates. Uh, we know that the elections are right around the corner, so uh, I hope that this session is going to allow you to uh, come up with, with uh, ideas for your own, give you something to implement in your own libraries, um, and maybe just something to think about, possibly uh, even for, for next time that there's an election. Um, I do want to note there's going to be ample time to share. We want to hear from you. Uh, so, you know, we uh, in the second half, uh, probably around 1030, we're going to switch over to kind of a Q&A discussion style. It's going to happen all all in the chat and uh, and in the Q and A box. Um, so so please feel free to use that. Um, if you do use that, um, especially in the chat, make sure to uh, to check the all panelists and attendees option in the to field. Um, otherwise, people aren't going to see. Um, if you do the all panelists section or all, all panelists option, only Nate Haley and myself see that. Um, so we want everybody to to we want this to be a discussion. Um, okay, so so let's jump in. Uh, let's take a look uh, at our agenda. As soon as I finish this intro. Introduction and welcome. I'm going to hand it over to Haley and Nate. Um, this is a particularly, I think, useful time for this. Uh, there's been some uh, discussion. This actually came out of the community engagement um, email list that we have on Rails. Some people were talking about what are you doing around the elections. Um, and I really appreciate Haley and Nate being willing to do this. I know that they've given uh, this presentation before in other contexts. Um, and I really like uh, what they have to offer. So um, when they're done, we're going to come back and do some discussion Q&A that we probably 20 to 30 minutes um, and then that will give you an opportunity to ask them questions or uh, talk um, amongst yourselves about what you're doing um, and then I'll do a quick wrap up at the very end and we'll have everybody out of here by 11 a.m. Um, okay, so some quick updates. Um, all right, so coming up in November, uh, we have a new webinar. And uh, if you're looking for advice on how to be successful in grant writing, uh, this is a great option for you. Uh, Stephanie Gerding is a author of Winning Grants, which is a publication from ALA Publishing. Uh, she's also, also the author of uh, Library Grants blog. Uh, she gives ample practice. Uh, she gives a bunch of practical tips on grant writing, uh, and I think it's going to be really useful. Uh, so please do check this out. Um, registration is happening via Zoom, uh, but you can find this event um, on our L2 calendar. Uh, another uh, webinar that we have coming up, and actually you have two opportunities to attend this one, one in October, one in November, uh, Managing Meetings, the Virtual uh, Meeting Experience and Beyond. Uh, this is a really another really practical topic. Uh, uh, if you're interested in sort of looking for guidance on skillfully navigating the virtual meeting environment, which I think we all are, uh, John Newton is the presenter. He's done uh, a lot of webinars for us in the past. Um, he has a ton of experience helping in for-profits, nonprofits, libraries, uh, and, and schools as well. Um, again, there's two opportunities, uh, October 29th and November 19th. Both of those are at 10 a.m. Um, and you can find this, uh, you can find both of those events on L2 and then registration um, is through Zoom. Uh, so when I was setting up this uh, online roundtable, I was kind of thinking to myself, what sort of webinars uh, would people who are interested in this topic be uh, be interested in? And so uh, actually this this webinar in particular came to mind. This is an archive session that we held back in June, um, but I think it's a great topic and I think it's a really good webinar. Um, Pat Wagner is a consultant and a trainer who focuses on productivity and workplace relationships. Uh, in this particular webinar, she talks about what it means uh, to be, uh, to to communicate with library patients in the virtual environment. And I really uh, like this because I think Pat does a nice job of understanding, uh, you know, where libraries are coming from and uh, what it means for libraries to start for, you know, communicating more with in the virtual environment. Um, some of you might be feeling a little downtrodden about the loss of kind of that personal connection uh, you have with patrons, uh, especially in the digital realm. Um, Pat talks about that and offers some strategies for overcoming that. Uh, I think it's really useful stuff. Uh, this was recorded in June 2020. It's archived on the Rails website. Anybody that has an L2 username and password can access it at any time. So I do want to recommend this. If you're interested in this, go back and take a look at it. You can watch it whenever. 
Um, okay, last thing I promise, and then uh, we're going to go over to Haley and Nate. Uh, okay, so uh, we actually have another online roundtable coming up at the end of October, uh, and uh, this one was actually another one that kind of came out of uh, the Rails um, email list. Uh, there was some talk about what people were using to stream the programs in their libraries. Um, we had a volunteer, Maria Fonseca, who uh, from Madison Area Public Library, who agreed to do a short presentation. Um, she's going to talk in particular about a service that she used called StreamYard, and and uh, this is a lot like Zoom, um, but sort of we're looking in this particular section where uh, 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 online roundtable, we're talking about things other than Zoom um, and, and, how, uh, and how libraries are using streaming services outside of Zoom to offer programs online. Um, you know, I, I think that, again, we really want this to be a conversation. So if you're using something different, if you have other ideas or, or you're looking for other ideas, uh, I would definitely sign up for this. Um, this is gonna be fun. We want this to be a conversation again. Uh, we want you to come share your ideas. Uh, so just check it out. It's under, uh, again, it's also an L2. It's under networking if you look uh, on our tags um, and you can register via Zoom. So uh, do, do sign up for that. Okay, uh, we are at the time where I'm going to turn it over to uh, Haley Samuelson and Nate Gass from uh, Cook Memorial Public Library District. Um, they're going to talk about their approach to the 2020 elections, what they've done in terms of voter education. Um, I'm really excited about this because I think that they have done a lot. Of, I, I've, I've seen their presentation before and I think that they've done a lot of cool things. So, um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, Haley and Nate, do you want to uh, start sharing your screen? Good morning, everyone. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Like Dan said, I am Haley Samuelson, and he is Nate Goss, and we are from um, Cook Memorial Public Library, so Libertyville and Vernon Hills area, so northern suburbs. And we have been immersed in this voter education universe for since about 2017 is when we started discussing it as part of our strategic plan. Um, Nate and I were on a breakout group that was looking at how do we address the information needs of our patrons and what do we anticipate those needs would be. Um, and so obviously after the 2016 election, there was a huge heightened interest in elections and politics and current events. And um, also that was around the time that um, that kind of seminal 2017 Pew study came out saying that um, as trust in institutions were declining, trusts in libraries were skyrocketing, and that people were looking to the library, to the library and their librarians as um, a place where they could get trusted information. And um, so when we took the needs of our service community, the trust in libraries and the heightened interest in politics, it just all kind of came together in a perfect storm, a perfect, <laughs> um, does it, a perfect box that we thought, okay, let's let's up our game on um, voter education. So we're going to be walking you through our resource. This is just one way of doing it. We're not saying this is the the way to do it. And we know that um, for some service communities, this probably wouldn't work well. Um, but we can talk about that in the discussion because we've we've been talking to librarians from across the nation and there's a lot of really cool stuff going on that can be adapted um, to a lot of different service communities. So Nate, do you want to share sure. our screen? So then um, I'll just kind of start at the... Yeah, so I'm just going to share basically what our page looks like. We do have, we were, we've been giving um, presentations on voter education. Um, we've given one for PLA and for a group called Info People. Uh, that's more of like a slideshow with a lot more information. If you're interested in seeing that at all, please reach out to us um, or maybe Dan can send it out or something if you want more of sort of like the, this is like the Cliff Notes version basically, <laughs> like the 15, 20 minute version where we're just going to go over our page. Um, but we do have a lot more uh, sort of like an hour long voter education webinar if anyone's interested. So what I'm sharing now is essentially just our uh, voter education resource, which we titled Be a Voter. So. Um, Haley, you had more to say, right? Um, yeah, so what we, how we started, and Nate's gonna talk about some of the web design, and, um, but our basic assumption was that our patrons were at point zero in understanding elections and the election process. And so that is where we started. So we're gonna go, you're gonna watch our, um, 
our resource start with the very basics and gradually build um, into where people where you're getting less low information voters. So I just kind of wanted to say that we are starting at ground zero and then building upon that. So Nate's going to talk a little bit about some of the design stuff at the top and then um, I'll be back. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so this is our page. Um, we actually decided to brand the page. We called it Be a Voter. We gave it a logo. Um, one of the reasons we decided to do that as opposed to just kind of having a page called like Voter Education Resource um, was, uh, first of all, you know, by giving it a name like Be a Voter, um, we were sort of hoping that it would uh, catch people's eyes a little bit, um, you know, something a little bit less, uh, more, more inviting than just say like voter education. The other thing we wanted to do was create a logo because we wanted to be, make sure that when we shared this out on social media um, or when we shared it out elsewhere, um, if the place we were sharing it did any sort of screen scraping, which is basically where uh, they're going to, you know, the, the site is going to scrape the screen and find featured images and things like that. We wanted to have it show a nice logo um, that, would sh that would sort of invite someone to want to click on our link and then they would see it's from the library. So hopefully they would feel it was trusted. Now, the way we decided to do it, because I am the webmaster and I was kind of involved in this project, was we had the um, privilege of being able to go in and edit this as we needed um, without having any issues of needing to work with like our, uh, another webmaster or IT. This is the kind of thing that's going to need to be updated fairly regularly. So um, we were in a position where we could do that. This is a WordPress website in case anyone's curious. So I'm able to go in and actually I've trained Haley enough to be able to go in and edit this as much as needed. Some of you libraries, especially, uh, you, you might not be in that situation. And so what I want to talk about before we even jump into this is some options for you. Uh, what we've seen other libraries do is even something as simple as creating a public Google Doc. There was a library in New Jersey that did this. And that's a really great way to be able to have anybody, no matter where you are, what department you're in, what privileges you have for your website, be able to put together a very quick voter education resource. So we always recommend basically everything you see on this page, you can do in a Google document if you don't have access to your library's website. If you do have access to your library's website, you'll wanna kind of work with your webmaster and figure out where within the site you're gonna to wanna to put it. We decided to treat it sort of like a research database and put it alongside a lot of our research databases. Um, which you're not seeing here because I have the page open, but in the breadcrumbs, you can see that it's part of our research area of our website. Then we basically had to figure out how we were going to promote it, especially as the elections were coming up. So we have featured images on our homepage. We have a featured database section within the research page um, that shows it. And then when there isn't an election that's right on the horizon, it basically just constantly lives within our A to Z listing of our databases. Now, the other thing that we did as far as initial decisions for the page is we wanted to make sure that it was all going to fit on one page. We didn't want people to have to click around a lot to go to like, for instance, uh, have a sub page here and there, like voter registration, click, goes to a new page. We didn't want to do that. One of the main reasons is because we really wanted this to be mobile friendly because at this point in the game, mobile usage of our websites has surpassed desktop usage. Even though we on the reference desk are often on, the on our desktops, we get in the habit of kind of viewing our library website as if it's a desktop site, but a lot of our users are using this in a mobile environment. And even though this page, you will look at it, it seems like it's very long. It's a very long page. On a mobile environment, that's not as big of a deal because mobile users can scroll very easily. What they can't do is tap around a lot and wait for things to load on sometimes what's not as reliable of a mobile network. So what we did, even though it's long, one of the ways we did to make sure that it was still navigable and usable was by having a sub menu here. Um, and Haley's gonna go into a lot more detail about the actual content. But just know that we have this submenu, which uses what's called anchors, which will take you to specific sections within a page. And then within each section, you can go back to the top. And this allows us to have a long page, but one that's easily, you can easily move around within and get to whatever information you may be looking for um, specifically. And then the last thing I will mention um, is that all the stuff that we decided should go on the page came out of, uh, we actually decided to craft guidelines before we started um, on what we were gonna include, what we weren't gonna include, what we saw our role as, what the mission of the page was. And we recommend libraries do this because 
Um, it does help you if you do get challenges about why isn't this on the page? Why did you leave this out? Why did you link to this site and not this site? It helps to have a written document of guidelines. And if you wanna see an example of that, again, just reach out to us. We will give you our PDF version of it. Um, and it was actually an extension of our collection development policy. So we kind of even had it sort of written within line of what the library was already doing. All right, so I'm gonna bounce this back over to Haley and she can start talking about what's actually on our page. I'm gonna reiterate, this is our page, not the end all be all of what every single page should look like. Just an example of what we did. Thanks, Nate. Um, one of the things I just did wanna say about be a voter exclamation point is I, we really wanted it to translate into action. Take this, take this information and now act on it. And so we wanted just a more active name for our page than voter education. Um, the first thing, like I said, we start at the basics and the very first thing you will see on our page is this is a nonpartisan resource for the Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 general election. Going into the midterms, I was stunned at how many patrons came in and said, do you know the date of the midterm election? And it was like emblazoned in my brain. I'm like, how do you not know this? So first thing, we put the date. Um, the next thing, we didn't want to assume that people knew what a different the different election is. This is our fourth election that we've been through, and it's our first general election. We've done a midterm, a consolidated, a primary, and now the general election. So we define what a general election actually is. And that's also for um, newly minted American citizens, um, your 17, 18 year olds, first time voters, um, you know, just to make sure that they know what they're actually voting in. Because there is so much um, going on and so much focus on mail-in and early voting, we moved that up to the top of our page. Um, usually it wouldn't be the first thing you would get to. We, we would start with registering to vote because that's step one <laughs> in actually voting and voter education. But because of the nature of what's going on, um, we did move that up. And um, that all links to um, our county clerk. And if you've heard us speak before, you know that the election authorities in Illinois are your Illinois State Board of Election and your county's clerk. So we're Lake County, so we um, really lean heavily on our Lake County clerk. We were able to do this time around um, host Robin O'Connor. Um, and she came in and talked to um, us about vote by mail and what the clerk's office is doing and how that's gonna look. And we were able to, um, link to an archive of that. So people people have questions, it's right there and they can um, click on the link to watch that program. So the um, first thing is obviously in voting is registering to vote and Illinois is a very, very um, voter friendly state. We have automatic voter registration that was um, that was signed into law by a Republican governor. It had strong bipartisan support. So um, we've got automatic voter registration, in-person voter registration, online voter registration, and um, registration by mail. Um, we also quietly just um, highlight that um, that you can your um, voting rights are restored if you've been convicted of a felony um, and that you have served your time. Uh, so we just quietly let people know that on there and um also to have those different ways that you can register to vote i was telling nate i just had a patron yesterday who came in to register to vote in person that deadline has already passed but you can still register online until october 18th so i was able to walk him through the online voter registration process and he left happy we had another registered voter in illinois so it worked out great so we highlight important dates and I'm going to hand that back to Nate because there's um, some web design stuff <laughs> to talk about. So you can see I'm really the technical person in this um, partnership <laughs> web type stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just well, one thing that I'll just point out as far as design choices that we made to make this a little bit easier to navigate and browse is um, you'll notice that every heading we have has this little icon. It's just to sort of give a, a visual stop sign basically like you are in a new section. We also do that with a thin gray line here, just to sort of delineate where the section starts and stops. Those icons, by the way, are freely available. Um, we actually have them linked at the bottom of our page. They're by a artist, I, I, well, a group called Free Pick. Um, so anybody who wants to use them can, and they have basically a bundle of icons that are election related. So that's what we used. 
Um, and then for this important dates section, um, we have it set up as sort of a, a table, but um, we created this button. This is from a service called, it's eventable.com, E-V-E-N-T-A-B-L-E.com. You can go there and set up a free account and then basically just create um, events that can be integrated with Google Calendar, Apple Calendar, Outlook, all that stuff. And then they give you a button that you can embed on your website. So we decided this would be a great way to kind of make it more interactive and engaging where not only do you see the important dates, but you can actually click on that button and it will add the date to your personal calendars. Then we're gonna move on and we actually get into our candidates. And this is where if you decide to start linking to candidate websites, your page can get super bloated because there's so many candidates, um, there's different parties that you need to represent and lay out. And so um, we decided to save space and not make it so huge by every, um, every uh, elected uh, office is sort of wrapped up into what we call an accordion. So you can click on it and then it will expand. So if you're looking for the information, you can click on it to expand it. If not, you just skim right past a little sort of uh, series of accordions instead. Um, within that, uh, you'll notice the way we've laid it out is intentional actually. Um, we list the candidate to the left with their party and then their website to the right. Uh, when you're talking about the general election, this isn't as big of a deal because pretty much every candidate most of them, not all of them, especially once you get to the lower offices, local offices here. Uh, but most candidates in this election will have a website. But when you get to, if you decide to do this for sort of your consolidated elections, where you've got people running for things like school boards, library boards, um, not every candidate's going to have an official website. Um, and so what we ran into with our last election was where um, some candidates had sites, some didn't, and we used to just hyperlink the name of the person if they had a website. From a design standpoint, that became a problem because some people actually viewed that as us favoring some candidates over others because it looked like we were highlighting them in different colors. That wasn't true. What we were really doing was just linking to their websites, um, but we decided to take that criticism and try to fix it by basically having all the candidates listed in the same way on the left, and then if they have a website, it's listed separately to the right. So these are the kind of design choices that you, you really want to work on making your, uh, your resource nonpartisan and unbiased because that's sort of the trust we have as the library. And sometimes your design choices can give off uh, a perceived bias even when you don't mean for it to. And so that's sort of something we really try to keep in mind when we're designing everything here. Um, and I'm going to pass it back over to Haley so we can move on to more of the content that we decided to include. Can you scroll back up so we can just talk about the disclaimer real quick? Oh, yes, sure. Yeah, um, we we came up with a just a small disclaimer, and I would say use disclaimers very judiciously because you don't want to plant seeds of doubt. But um, especially with the next election that's coming up in April, which is going to be a consolidated election, and that's mostly local offices, it's really hard to find websites, and a lot of people are on a limited budget, so they do more Facebook page, and um, and our perfect librarian world, people would use. Um, standardized language so they would actually refer to the office correctly in their on their Facebook page they would know what they're running for um, but we found that it's it can be like a needle in a haystack so we just put a um, disclaimer up that's saying hey if we missed you contact us we want to feature you this was we're, we're doing the best that we can here so just a quick disclaimer there and then we also um, wanted to highlight that the Lake County um, clerk's office has a thing called voter power, which is an excellent resource. And um, we want to, if people want to see a sample ballot, they can go right to voter power and see that sample ballot. Okay. Yeah, Haley, I'm just going to add real quick that this is probably the most labor intensive part of what we do. And so not every library is going to have the time and resources to do that. And so um, I've seen some libraries just kind of say, for candidate listings, visit voter power or shoot them to somewhere else for it. And so that's a decision that every library kind of has to make on their own, I think. And I just, I wanted to keep our library users kind of coming back to the library to look for that information. So it was a very intentional decision on our part to list the candidates and link to their campaign site because they could use the library as a hub for all things elections. So, um, okay, and we're gonna kind of 
blow through this next part of government sites, but I think government sites are a little bit boring, but they're essential because they are the people who are running the elections. There are election authorities and there's a lot of great information on these websites, but they're really dense. So we just tried to break up where and tease out the information that we thought people needed. We tried to limit um, the amount of clicks. So like if you see federal voting assistance program that is featured on the Lake County clerk site and on the Illinois State Board of Election, but the final destination is always the federal voting assistance program. So we just eliminated and went right to that source that so they don't have to click, 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 click. They could just click once. Um, and then the presidential election election process that is um, a USA.gov resource that the federal government has put together to walk voters through what happens in a presidential election. And also on that, on that site is a really great and very thorough <laughs> glossary of terms. So if somebody doesn't know gubernatorial means governor, like that's a place that they could go. So again, having that assumption that people don't have the same level of knowledge that we do because we've been immersed in elections for three years now so this stuff is kind of a second nature to us um for the more savvy voter and people who really want to follow the money we do have a campaign finance um, disclosure so it's there if people want it um news coverage of the election what we chose to do this time is chicago sometimes chicago tribune and daily herald all have um specific places on their websites that are uh, um, political coverage and election coverage, but they can be kind of hard to find. So we link directly to just the political coverage. Um, this would be a place that you could highlight any database subscriptions you have. So if you want, if you have New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Press Reader, whatever you wanted to do, this is a great place to market other database subscriptions. And we have done that with the New York Times. We did that especially during the primary when um, there was about, what, um, 100 uh, Democratic candidates <laughs> or seemingly felt like that, that we could help, we could link to something that was really helpful in the New York Times and break down those candidates. We always list the debates. So if people want to educate themselves more, um, they know the time and the place of the debates. Um, during the, um, the uh, primaries we had where you could watch it because they weren't widely televised um, and then what has happened which has been actually an upside of covid is our local newspaper regional newspaper the daily herald has had roundtable discussions with every office that's on the ballot and then have put those on their websites so they call them to sometimes they call them debates sometimes they call them conversations with but how often do you get to listen to a conversation between the two candidates for coroner? Like if you really want to research your ballot out, there are some great resources there. And I don't know if that's something that people would find on their own, but we definitely wanted to highlight that. And I think in all the years I've been voting in Illinois, I'm not sure I've ever heard um, Dick Durbin debate his opponent. So I just, this is the kind of an upside of COVID. And I really hope that the, the Daily Herald continues doing this because they're just Zoom discussions and it's with the editorial board and especially going forward into a consolidated election, it's very, very low turnout. And the reason people give for very low turnout is that they can't find information on the, um, on the candidates. Our last um, general consolidated election in 2019 had a 12% turnout rate in Lake County. I mean, that's abysmal. And these are the people who are deciding your property taxes, who are running your libraries, who are running your school districts. And so I really hope that Daily Herald will continue that because I just think that's just a really great thing. Nate and I also dabble in fake news classes. So we have a pretty robust fact checking section because it's just something that's near and dear to our hearts so you don't have to have 52 fact checking sites like we do it's just something we're passionate about and then we link to other things that are just general resources that we feel that are nonpartisan um civic organizations that we feel like give really good information um the second one on the list the bestcolleges.com student voting guide i found that on about a half a dozen secretary of state sites so it's a neutral site that um, states were sending their college students to, but it's, um, it walks the, it has these great different sections that um, walk a college student through the whole process and what's at stake and why you should vote in the different parties and what they stand for. And it's just a, it's just a great resource. And 
again, we wanted to just kind of weave in some special voting circumstances without um, kind of hammering that. And then I just have a um, special place in my heart for TurboVote. It's just something, it's a nonpartisan group. You sign up for texts and they, they've they texted me to tell me that, you know, early voting has started in Illinois. They're texting me on election day and tell me it's election day and text me the information, um, you know, the address of my polling site. So if my polling site is new or I'm new to the area, I have the address right there. I can just, you know, tap on it and it will bring me to maps, tells you the hours of your polls. So it's just, um, they don't text a lot. It's just um, during kind of important times in an election cycle. So I just, you know, we wanted to let people know that that was there. So I think I'm gonna hand this back to Nate and um, let him wrap it up and then we'll be open for questions. Yeah, so we're, we need to get to the Q&A. So I'm just gonna go real quick. Um, just we, we linked to the official pages of the main political parties. Obviously, there are more political parties than this, but these are the uh, parties that have a county representation within our state. So these are the ones that we tend to highlight, you know, the, the two biggies, the Green Party, Libertarian Party. We also base a lot of our, um, what we end up putting on here, whether you're talking about parties or candidates, we base a lot of that on what ends up being on the ballot itself. Once the ballots come out, we kind of use that as our rubric of what gets included and what doesn't get included. Um, and then we have just a little bit of disclaimer, kind of wrap up information at the very bottom, just to kind of cover our bases. One of which is just to let people know that this is personally curated by librarians, that any of these links that we provide out are only for informational purposes. We're not in any way uh, endorsing anything necessarily that we're putting out here or any candidate. We give the little sort of uh, credit where credit's due to the icons that we, that we used. And then the last thing we do is we always put a timestamp at the bottom so people can know when was the last time this page was checked. Because again, you're gonna have to, uh, you know, this is a page that gets looked at pretty frequently, but we do, you know, this is only a little sliver of our job as librarians. So there are times where new information has come out and we don't get to it for an, a day or two. At least the timestamp lets people know maybe why it hasn't been touched yet. So that was a super, super, super quick rundown of our page. Um, but now I really want to open this up for questions and start talking about what other libraries have been doing for this stuff. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Stop sharing, Dan. Is that, is, should I go ahead and take my... Yeah, you, yep, you can stop sharing. Yeah. And, and, you know, if we have any questions, I'll, we'll go back to, to this page. Um, okay, so yeah, so right now we are in our Q&A section and I have a couple of questions waiting for you, uh, Nate and Haley. Um, okay, so the first one, and this, this was echoed a couple times, is can we steal this? <laughs> uh, can, can we uh, copy it all, um, modified for our own counties? I'm thinking of an info sheet for our call centers, desk centers, and then um, actually Jennifer asked, can we link straight to this? Mm -hmm. that's, that's okay with you all? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, we're librarians, so we're all about sharing. And, <laughs> you know, of course. I, yeah. I, and I, I forgot to mention, you can even use the logo. Other libraries have used the logo. We have permission from our graphic artist. He is just sort of wanting this to, you know, help out with voter education in any way. If you do decide to use the logo, um, his name is Andrew Trainer. if you ever, and you can reach out to us. We'll send it to you and we'll give you the site. Mm -hmm. so. Awesome. And if you do, if you do use our stuff and accommodate it or change it to your own, please send us a link. We love seeing what other people's doing, people are doing, and we steal stuff right on back. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. What it was at the beginning, and a lot of the ideas we've put in are things that we've taken from other libraries. So yeah, yeah, it's not stealing. It, what's, uh, let's be clear with everyone: it's not stealing. It's uh, it's borrowing. Right. <laughs> collaboration right <laughs> yeah exactly collaboration um okay this is this is a good question from anonymous do you have a nonpartisan resource for information on the fair tax amendment uh did you all run into that okay you did okay do you do you want to do you want to point to that would, would you or, or um do you want me to stop sharing what would be easiest for you Haley, do you want to talk about it and I'll, I'll actually just bring it up what we ended up linking sure, to sure um the the main thing that we have linked to is the secretary of state's pamphlet. There's a PDF version on the Secretary of State site. And um, that was mailed out to voters everywhere. So people may have already had it, but it's a pro con and it's government. Um, we also are the um, Sun Times and the Chicago Tribune have both done breakdowns of um, 
the fair tax amendment and kind of laying out in a little bit shorter version of the Secretary of State's and we just have to decide if we want to link to that or you know we're, we're always in fear of bloating um the website because there's always so much good information out there but um the the main nonpartisan we we chose was just the secretary of state's pamphlet and i actually i voted yesterday and i used this pamphlet i read through it to kind of become informed on this actual issue and it was the most helpful thing i found personally so that's great. This is that's, that's a wonderful resource. Yeah, you know what? I, let me just say, you're all like walking a tightrope on this uh, a little bit, you know. But you're doing it. You're doing it so gracefully. Um, I, that's what I love about this uh, because it, it is tough, and and uh, you know the the opportunity to to rankle folks, frankly, um, just exists. Um, and uh, but but I think that this is good, and there's a lot of just like straight up resources for people on this. Um, Okay, uh, actually, um, okay, so I have a question from Dawn, and Dawn asks, do you work with the League of Women Voters at all? Yes and no. Um, our direct communities um, don't really have a very active, our, our, our county has a very active League of Women Voters, but our service communities do not. Um, so several of our neighboring um, libraries have hosted League of Women Voters. Um, uh, forums and you know pre-COVID that is not something that um, we have pursued just because like our local there's just not a lot of local legal women, women voters I mean they have outstanding um, services and you know they're there I have watched their debates for my own personal but it's just something that we have had a hard time kind of threading that needle yeah, I think uh, maybe maybe they, they there are stronger presences in other counties and other areas of, of Illinois. And I I've been kind of looking through the participant list, and I see people from all over. Um, mm -hmm. So so that that's definitely something I think to turn to uh, in your own area if that um, if there is a presence. But I, I appreciate that. Um, okay, uh, I do have a, a question. This is more of a um, request from Anna that um, Nate, Nate uh, or Haley, if you can spell the name of the graphic artist, uh, and maybe you can put that into the chat, or or you can, or I can put that in the chat too if you want me to. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see here. Dan from Burr Ridge has a question. Uh, okay, so you maybe have, there are a good percentage of, of users in a lot of our libraries who are um, who are just not internet users, and uh, and so they you know the, those people um, might not be able to find this resource. How do you translate that into a print version? How do you how do you uh, how do you source this for uh, the you know people on the other side of the, the digital divide? Right. Thank you so much for that question and. Nate and I have had this question over and over again, and it's something that we're really wrestling with because, first of all, during the budget crisis, so much of Illinois' government went online because it was more cost effective than print. Um, you know, second, secondly, newspapers have been slash, slash, slash. So they're on shoestring budgets, they're on shoestring reporters. I mean, we have our local Daily Herald um, newspaper reporters use the library as their office. They don't even have office space anymore. So this is something that we have really struggled with as things have migrated online. And I wish I really had a good answer for you. I've seen some people, some libraries have um, tried to get creative and like have um, a way that you can print out the resource. But then of course that has limitations because what you're linking to are websites. Um, you know, Nate and I have pre-COVID, <laughs> um, we have had um, pop-in demonstrations or just a pop-up demonstration where we sat in the lobby of the library and tried to catch um, our library users after, you know, um, uh, programming that we know attracts more seniors, not trying just to, <laughs> but, you know, people that might not feel as comfortable. Um, We've, you know, trained our reference librarians and our public desk staffs on how to use Be a Voter so they can help walk through um, patrons and, you know, it has helped their workload. So it, it's, we don't have a great answer. And if anybody has a great answer, please email us because we would love to be able to adapt this. And we know that this is a shortcoming of the resource. And I don't know, Nate, if you have anything to add to that. No, um, it's something that I know we've, we've talked about a ton. And also it's near and dear to me because a huge part of my job is 
computer classes, training, trying to bridge that digital divide that we know is there, you know? And also what do you do when, especially like if some of your libraries might not even be open and people might not have internet access right now uh, during this COVID pandemic. So it's something that I'm very aware of or both very aware of. Uh, like Haley said, we did the pop-up demos pre-COVID and those were kind of fun because we basically just had a monitor at the table and we would just walk people through the resource, you know? Um, answer any questions they had. The only other thing I'll add, which Haley, you know, alluded to is that this is technically a resource for our patrons, but it has become a very central resource for our desk staff. So for those people who aren't, uh, you know, tech savvy, who, who can't necessarily navigate a website very easily, we're hoping maybe they're calling the library and our reference librarians can basically use our resource to get them the information that they need. It's not a great answer, but it's sort of the best we have at the moment. <laughs> Every time we register somebody to vote in person at the library, the final closing is, hey, we have this resource, you're here, and we want you to be educated on it. Um, you know, again, if it's somebody who's choosing to register to vote in person, then they may not have access to an online form, but it is something that we have really been trying to work through. How do you distill this much information into a usable print format um, beyond um, walking people through it? And, you know, I actually, I'm gonna, I haven't said anything to Nate about this, but I just, I was thinking about those Daily Herald debates and I would love to have like, ho be able to host some like debate watch parties and just kind of say, hey, if you wanna come learn more about this, where we'll put it up on the big screen if you don't have um, access to internet at home. Again, we're in the time of COVID, <laughs> so can't have big groups coming in to watch. Cause I'm sure like everybody would just pile in to hear about the circuit court Work, you know <laughs> but yeah maybe you can like netflix party the the the, the debates right yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. i guess that's the easiest way to do it um okay uh this is this is a great question so Roz asks have you been able to measure numbers of registered voters in your district since implementing the site that's a fantastic question i was even gonna ask you all that so um any any sort of like uh measurements that you can share with us um registered voters not so much. That is, you can find that all on um, the clerk's website. They have voter turnout, number of registrants, and the turnout. So that's how I know off the top of my head we had a 12% turnout for um, consolidated election, but that's all of Lake County. Um, you can drill down to precinct turnout if you want. So that's like, I can see who on my block <laughs> voted, not many people in the consolidated election. Um, you but what we the metric we have used and nate can talk about this a little bit better than i can we have um measured usage of the page and how many hits we're getting and where they're coming from and kind of what's been driving that traffic yeah actually um and if i can kind of I'm, I'm i'm wondering if i'm reading between the lines here and it's kind of like is this is this page actually getting used is it actually being used is it worth it is it worth the effort and i got to be honest uh, as the webmaster because a lot of librarians have ideas for pages and I'm constantly saying, I'm constantly kind of having to turn it down because if we did everything, our site would be so bloated with stuff that no one's really using. So I use a very sort of analytical kind of like usage reporting. We're constantly looking and I can say, I went to Haley and I said, we will try this. Okay, but if it doesn't get any use, we're not gonna keep doing this. And I was skeptical. I was like, I think it's gonna be great information and no one's gonna look at it. And I was just dead wrong. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in the lead up to the, the first time we did this, which was for the midterm, in the lead up to it, the week before the midterm, it was by far the most used page on our website. And this is the key. The average time spent on the site was 15 minutes. That's insane. Um, so, and, and if you ever want to see those reports, they're kind of boring to look at, but I've got them if you want to see them. Um, but, you know, that shows that not only were tons of people using this site, um, but they were actually using it. They were spending time there. They were going through it, scouring it, and um, actually getting the information that they needed. So that was very encouraging. And that has not stopped. Um, even in the consolidated election, which had dismal, abysmal turnout, um, that page was actually, again, like the most popular page in the week up to that election on our website. Um, so definitely has been worth it as far as just from a user experience analytics standpoint, if that answers the question. 
Yeah, f- 15 minutes, that is crazy. That, <laughs> that is crazy. Uh, but that's also, yeah, that, that great answer. I, I love that. Um, okay, uh, I do want to pivot a little bit to asking libraries what they are doing. And we have um, some discussion questions. So uh, this will be your chance to answer. You can answer directly into the chat. I'm going to put the question in the chat. It has Q1 in front of it, just to indicate that it's the first question. If you answer it, please put A1. We want to hear your answer. Uh, and we want to kind of associate it with the question. Um, and so the question is, what, uh, what program, uh, I spelled that wrong, what programs or services are you offering in regards to voter education at your library? This is, again, your chance to kind of, um, uh, to, to let us know. If you do answer, make sure to put the uh, all panelists and attendees in that two field. Um, if you just do all panelists, it's only going to go to Haley, Nate, and I. Um, we, we want everybody to see what you're saying, so um, I appreciate that. And I also want to acknowledge, Jennifer, I saw your question, and your question is a great discussion question, so I'm going to answer, I'm going to ask it next, um, but I want to give people the, the opportunity to, um, to answer this one first, um, but I think it relates super well. Um, okay, and while we're waiting for people to answer, um, I also want to uh, show you something, and I think this relates kind of nicely. Uh, okay, you know what, I think I have to do a stop share, and I'm going to do another share just of my screen. Um, okay, oh, uh, get out here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I just wanted to make you aware, uh, this, and I think this sort of relates um, to, to Nate and Haley, Haley's presentation a little bit. So I have the new L2. This is uh, totally like self-promotion here, uh, but the new L2, and you may not be aware, but in the advanced search of our member directory, if you look under advanced and you click that, um, Haley and Nate, I believe that your library is in the 51st house district, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and you can actually search public libraries by that district and find out how many public libraries are in that. And it will show you a list of all of those libraries. It's taking a second here. Uh, but so I'm seeing, you know, Barrington, Cook, uh, uh, Ela area, Fremont, and, and all those libraries are listed. And you can do that for your particular area. This applies to anywhere in Illinois. Uh, so this is kind of a cool little feature that, that, um, that is new to L2 that I'm really excited about. And it's not just the House District, it's Senate District, it's Congressional District, um, it's County. So this is a way that you can search other libraries. So if you want wanted to get together with other libraries to do, uh, you know, some sort of a countywide page or something like that, you could do that. Um, so that's one, one resource. Okay, uh, let's get to some of the answers that we're seeing from people in chat. Uh, okay, so um, Dawn says, uh, voter information table with the League of Women Voters. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Megan says, we have a page on our website and are working on an election Q&A video uh, with our, that's cool. I, I love the okay. idea of a video. Uh, Roz says, hosted a program with Lake County Kirk about uh, Kirk about mail-in voting options, then an explanation of the graduated tax amendment with a local professor. Really cool. Um, they, the graduated tax amendment was very popular. Um, Jennifer says, we link to ballotready.org and encourage our patrons to check it out in order to educate, educate themselves. Um, Megan said, we also had a League of Women Voters table info table. Um, Kathy says a voter registration page, including voter education resources and deadlines, not nearly as nice and comprehensive as yours. Great job. Uh, cool. Okay. Awesome. I love these. Keep, keep them coming. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to ask Jennifer's question here. And I think this is a really good, good one, especially for this particular, um, uh, election. So this is Q2. If you have an answer for this, uh, please use A2. Um, the question is, how many libraries out there are hosting a secure ballot drop box in their in their lobbies? Um, are, uh, Haley and Nate, are you all, I, I, maybe I missed this if you said it, are you all hosting a, no? Okay. No, they, um, in Lake County, which the, the first thing, the first boxes that are going out had to have 24 hour surveillance on camera and lighted. So because it, they were really kind of not scrambling, but they were, you know, they wanted to get these out and they wanted to have security on them. Um, they started with courthouses. We had our pitch all ready for Robin O'Connor about how we would be a great place to have a Dropbox. So anybody who has a Dropbox, I'm super jealous and that's awesome. Um, but yeah, she had already made the decisions by the time we had our like, hey, think of us. Um, and then I, whoever talked about ballot ready, I, I love that resource. And what is nice again for Illinois is it's housed out of University of Chicago. So the information for Illinois is so robust and it's just a really nice user 
interface and I love that you have resume like I'm really nosy so I want to know where people went to college and what kind of degrees they have and you know if they're smarter than me if they're going to be you know making the laws and stuff <laughs> so I love that ballot ready just has that all right there yeah and we should keep our eye on ballot ready by the way because we actually have spoken with some folks from there and they are like their next step is basically creating these toolkits. Um, it wouldn't be free. It's something that an organization would have to pay for, but a business or organization can actually like take all of their data and their entire sort of engine for their website and kind of brand it for their purposes. So oh, that's so cool. That like a, like a template. I don't think yeah. we're quite there yet, but that could be down the road where libraries kind of partner with them because once you do that, you can actually input your own data too on top of what's in ballot ready. Um, so they were supposed to send us kind of a quote of what that was going to cost, but they haven't done that yet. So, but I mean, they're, they're probably scrambling busy right now, but like, just keep an eye on ballot ready. Cause I really think it could be a opportunity for some great partnerships down the road. Yeah. And if any of you are looking at the daily Herald, the political site, there's a thing at the top. I can't remember what they call it, but if you, it's basically look at your offices and if you click through it's ballot ready stuff, I recognized the layout and the format right away. And I was like, Hey, they're using Bell already. <laughs> yeah, but it's branded for Daily Herald, so that they're basically using that toolkit that that that's out there. So it's it's cool. Yeah. When yeah, when that is ready, we'll have to let let me know. We'll we'll have maybe we'll try to get them to come and do like a Rails presentation for oh, everyone. It would that, be it would be cool if we could do like a collaborative county, like you said. Yes. Like county libraries get together, and if the libraries could share the cost. <gasps> That would be amazing. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I love I'm it. Everybody's budget. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, some, some great, some great comments coming in and, and thank you all for, for responding. First of all, before, before we get to those, I just want to mention, uh, uh, would you actually, would you all be able to put a link in, in the website to, to your, uh, to the, um, be a voter, uh, in the, in, sorry, into the chat. Um, and Yuli says, uh, can you drop the link to the resources shared? I miss, oh, and also uh, Yuli, um, uh, Nate and Haley are from Cook Memorial Public Library District in Libertyville and Libertyville environs, correct? Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> All right, um, okay, so going back to question one, remember, remember question one was just about general programs or resources, Kim. Uh, Kim, thank you for, for um, your comment. At Columbia College, uh, at Academics uh, Library, we are working with a faculty member who initiated a voter registration program called Columbia Votes to encourage all students to vote. That's, that's awesome. Great. Um, Jennifer says, we, uh, Park Ridge, have a community network website that is run by our reference librarians where we have a page dedicated to voter information. The page is not as involved and doesn't look as good as this. From the library, we use our social media to drive traffic there, including reminders to vote, vote early, register, make a plan, etc. I love, I love all the messaging behind the make a plan. Um, I've, you know, that, that is like, I love the, and I love how you all have been, um, you know, smart about that kind of like encouraging people to make it to, to do an action, right? To, to make a plan to, to get involved that way. Uh, Christina says, we have a page on our website with early voting location and dates, as well as link to ballot ready, Cook County Clerk's website, vote411.org. Um, okay, looks like uh, most of the other answers are for, uh, for the ballot box. Uh, Frankfurt is, Plainfield <laughs> is, um, not Winfield, very close to the Page County Complex, okay, where they have one. Um, Jennifer, as I informed our village clerk that they are open, they're looking for a place in our area. She promised to pass it along up the chain. Jennifer, hope, hope yes, you get your ballot um, box. Uh, we are polling place so people can drop off ballots to the election judge. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, libraries are, are um, uh, ballot, uh, sorry, election uh, places, polling places. Not Winfield, uh, let's see here. Program, oh, this is good. This is from question one. Annie says, program on Tuesday with the ACLU about voter rights, video series about voting, worked with federal congressional staff to explain best ways to communicate with representatives. Oh, that, Annie, that sounds really cool. Do, yeah. If you have a link to that, um, I, we would love to share that in the, in the chat. Thank you for that. Yes, please. I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, Kim says, in addition to Columbia Votes, we are updating our LibGuide. Of course, love it. Um, oh, Kathy asks, who, who runs Ballot Ready? Does that, do you, do you yeah, know? I, um, I should have, it, it started out as a grant based organization and now they're trying to sell their product because I think their grant is running out. It was University of Chicago, the Knight Foundation, which is a journalistic foundation. And then um, the uh, MacArthur Foundation, John T, Catherine T MacArthur um, underwrote their original um, 
start and they started regionally. It's like I said, um, Illinois was their home base and then they, they've spread out. Um, and so it, like it was a nonprofit grant based thing um, that started in 2018 was their first election cycle through. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, Nate put the Nate put the link in there, and I and I uh, put it in there again just so everybody could see it. Um, uh, so it's cooklib.org/slash/be-a-voter, um, and uh, let's see here. I also wanted to get to something else, which was oh, okay, Paula's question in the archive. Can you please include in the chat? What we'll do, uh, Paula, is I will save this chat as a document. I, I think I can save it as like a Word document or something like that. And I'll put it onto the community engagement email list. So uh, we don't, Rails doesn't have like a voter information page, um, but I'll put it, if you if you join that email list or if you're part of that email list, um, it'll be on there and you can find that. And I'll also link to the recorded session when, when that's available. So thank you for that question. I appreciate that. Um, okay, I want to get to Yui's comment. We don't have anything yet, but I'm so glad I came here. I have plenty of ideas now to add info to our website. We are main, uh, mainly we've all been doing is helping people register and check the registration as they come in. Awesome. Okay. Um, one one question uh, that that wasn't asked that I kind of want to get to, and um, I don't want this to be a downer, but have you have you encountered any like negative reactions and i know you talked a little bit about like why why didn't you link to this website resource or anything like that but has that ever been something that your reference you know front of house people have had to deal with in the past on this we um in the first midterm we took out facebook ads um and because we wanted to catch non-library users and we had pushback of whether that was a good use of um library money library funding and were we if we hadn't been doing this prior then this was just um partisan well a we didn't have to defend ourselves at all because our patrons defended, our <laughs> defended us and talked about how you can we we spent i think a hundred dollars on facebook ads for like a six-week period i mean it was it's very nominal cost. I mean, I know for some libraries that would be a big cost, but for us, that was not. Um, we also have been doing voter education from the dawn of time. It used to be a, a vertical file. I'm aging myself, <laughs> but we had the pamphlets in there and the newspaper and, you know, people would come in and just take the file. So this isn't anything new. So when they said, well, if you weren't doing this during um, the previous administration, obviously you just have an ax to grind. That it, we, d we didn't even need to engage in that because we have been doing this for so long. Um, so uh, very nominal. I mean, the number one thing that we hear, and honestly, it just like makes me so happy is that people say there's something there for everybody. Um, one of my colleagues um, took me aside and said, my husband is a independent and then she whispered he's really a republican he says this is the best thing that the library has done in decades and i mean that was like okay my job is done here and like you said we do feel like we're walking in that tightrope um in our other presentations i tell people you can be an activist on your own time when you're in the library you're there for everybody and you have to walk that tightrope yeah. so yeah mm -hmm. so that we really haven't had Anything. We did have that pushback that I slightly mentioned during the candidates section um, on the consolidated election, mm -hmm. where some people thought we were kind of highlighting other people over other people um, with the way we laid it out, um, and also kind of asking the question, well, if you're if not everyone has a website, should you be sharing any websites? You know, I mean, I don't. I don't know that I don't know that that part of the question is really worth <laughs> engaging. I mean, you know, if it's information, it's good information, and it's a primary source. We want to get it out there. Yeah. Um, but I would say that what we learned from that is, you know, to take the criticism like to heart. Like, that doesn't mean we're going to shut the page down, but it does mean we're going to change the way we lay it out. You know, yeah. we're going to design things differently because that was a legitimate critique that came in. So, um, that's I think, like Haley said, it's that's been it. I mean. The, the, the percentage wise of negative to positive, it couldn't be more stark. I mean, we get so many good positive feedbacks about feedback about this. And then we occasionally get not even like a criticism, you know, not even like a negative, why are you doing this? But more like in the case of the Facebook ads, maybe you shouldn't be doing those. And, and also like, why did you do it this way? You know, yeah. so you just want to, that's where I think the, the guidelines come in really handy. If you've got a written document that says, this was our mission, this is how we decided what goes in, what goes out. This is what we decided we were gonna do to promote. 
you can fall back on that and your director can fall back on that. Cause honestly, those kind of criticisms, they go to the director and yeah. they need to be able to know how to combat that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, again, not to end on a downer note, but the next election is a consolidated election. And we have found that to be the most dicey because the people who are running are local. And so it's your neighbor, it's your niece, it's your, so people take that one a little more seriously. And that's, where we put the disclaimer of like, we have done to the best of our abilities, tried to find your Facebook page. Um, but, you know, if we missed you, it's, it's not nothing personal, let us know. And we're, you know, slap it up upon review. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, we, if we missed you, it's hard because we're librarians and we're information specialists at finding things. And it, it, it seems like it's pretty buried. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I love that you, in, you know, you all already referenced that Pew study where, you know, it said that libraries are one of the most pu publicly trusted uh, institutions. And, and I think, and, and you're right, that, that all kind of goes down to that, I think, um, and maintaining that trust. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, we, we are at 11. This has flown by. Um, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to actually uh, bring us to a close. Um, Haley, Nate, thank you so much for coming and, and, and presenting this information. It's great. Thank you for everyone who's, uh, drop their ideas and given links to things. Again, I'm going to try to put um, this chat into uh, the community engagement um, Rails email list. Um, if you're not already subscribed, it's really easy to do so. Just uh, make sure you have your L2 username and password and go to the Rails website. Um, and uh, again, thank you for coming. This has been a lot of fun. Um, hope you come to our next online roundtable um, and enjoy your weekend. It's Friday, everyone. So uh, have a great weekend. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you so much. Thank you.